And I want to start with just a story. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years. And people have been doing things for longer. People have been married for longer. But I've been doing this for 25 years. But I've been dealing with the, I guess, the the feedback and the feeling of this um, since I was a, a kid. And I remember a story that stuck with me from the age of 10 and 11 when I was living in the city of Melbourne. And Melbourne has these trams. And I took a tram into the city one day, and I, I can't even remember what the reason for the tram ride was, but it was, it was, it was a tram was full of people, <clears throat> and as a young kid, I was in my school uniform, and at the other end of the tram, it was packed. I could see this man, and he was the kind of character that I, and I'm sure you've had the experience, you're sitting on a train, you're sitting in some bus, and you see a person, and they're either wearing some extreme clothing or whatever they're doing, and you, and you catch a glimpse of them, and you try not to look at them or stare at them so that you don't lock eyes, but there's something about them that uh, you can't turn away. And this man struck me for the fact that, on, he, firstly, he was quite well-dressed, but he had this, this shock of white hair. He had the uh, gaunt-looking features, a bit like the skeleton, a bit like that, that gaunt features you saw that fellow in the Poltergeist movie, which... I don't even think it'd come out then. And then he had a kind of wispy, wispy, I don't even remember if he had a beard, but he had this gaunt look, but his eyes, the thing that struck me, he had these intense eyes. So I was trying not to look at him, but as a, as a wide-eyed, brown-eyed uh, young kid at the opposite end of the tram, of course, it's a, you, you're staring. So I was staring at this man, and, and his eyes locked at my eyes. And before I knew it, he actually started bounding down from the opposite end of the tram towards me. And I was frozen, completely frozen with fear. And he came right up to my face. He looked at me and he said, don't turn your back on the world. He then spun on his heels and walked all the way back to the other end of the tram. And I was absolutely still frozen in fear. And these words ring in my ears, don't, don't turn your back on the world. Well, I have tried. <laughs> I have tried to break that through most of my life. My, my life is not a life of trying to honour those words. It, it, it is a life of trying to escape from those words. I'm not a brave man. Uh, I have some intelligence, but I don't consider myself a super intelligent man. Uh, I don't consider myself even an honourable or moral man because I've made more mistakes than I care to divulge tonight but as much as I have tried to run away I keep finding myself brought back to those words don't turn your back on the world and so what I do isn't because I wish to be a uh, messiah I don't wish to be glorified I don't wish people to follow me. In fact, I say, and I say this to the people who are listening tonight and the people who, who may listen to the call, I don't want people to believe me. I'm not asking anyone to believe me. We are talking about ideas. We're talking about knowledge. We're talking about uh, competence. But we're not talking about abstracts that require any of you to believe or not believe, to have faith or not have faith. But I... I cannot because I have tried now too often. I have accepted now that as much as I try to run away, I come face to face with it again. So I do my job, and my job is to share information with you. Now, Eucadia is an immense idea, an immense idea. And the idea is simply one that all of us, and I as a child too, hoped one day would come true. And that is that one day when I read the Bible or I read the Quran or I read a piece of prophecy, one day all the evil in the world would cease and that those that fail in their duties would find themselves removed from duty and that there would be a balancing in the world. Now, I, I, I truly wish that those days to come true but what I discovered along my journey as I continued to run away 
and find myself back again, is that there have been many, many, many good people who have tried to contribute and help. But as far as philosophy and ideas and architecture go, there has been precious few that have presented alternate models to the existing system. And in the absence of a reasonable alternative, the system will not change. And if the system doesn't change, then the evil that we see will continue. So we live in a world of over 7 billion people. We live in a world of immense complexity of societies and jobs and money and economies and integrated businesses, computers, the internet. So to think that a romantic document is going to be able to sustain an alternate system is just not real. A valid alternative needs to have the depth, the detail, the competence, the scope in order to um, present a credible alternative to the system that is in place and has been built over not just hundreds of years, but now well over a few thousand years in its different components. So that is why Eukadia is so big. It's also why Eukadia addresses subjects like uh, money, reserve banks, Global Union Reserve Bank, uh, America's Union, Asia Union, Africans Union, Euro Union. It's why it deals with complex ideas like uh, the Globe Union Society, the Africans Union Society. These are trusts, by the way. And we'll talk about more about trusts in, in a moment and the conveyance of property and the importance of what Eukadia is able to present in the conveyance of property. It's not the New World Order. Why? Because the New World Order has already been in place for many, many years. I mean, one of the great misapprehensions or misdirections or whatever causes it that people find themselves in is believing that the New World Order is something that's coming. It's already here. In fact, we've gone through at least three versions of what one would call the New World Order over the last 200 years. Three versions. So if people are worried about the New World Order, they should really paraphrase it as the New, New, New World Order because we already have been going through several versions of the existing system. But in the absence of an alternative, in the absence of a credible model, then the system that we see at the moment that is imprisoning people and torturing people and taking their homes, taking their jobs and killing people is not going to change, can't change. Because the alternative is anarchy. And anarchy is not a basis of sustainable society. It might be the desire of one, but it is not a way of sustaining a society. So I understand the complexity of it. I understand that it's easy for people to pick out one page of over 40,000 pages that represents the Eukadian model and say, look, I found on one page, Frank says here, that uh, he supports a concept of a single currency. I've been writing this for 25 years and I apologise to each and every one of you that I have not yet come to correcting all the pieces. It's, a, it's an ongoing journey and an ongoing set of, of uh, ideas. But I have learned something and there is something to be learned for me as it is for, for all of us and that is it's not my job to do it all on my own. It's my job to present ideas and frameworks, but ultimately it is your choice whether you wish to participate and see those ideas become a reality. So I'm not going to be spending the rest of however many days, years, months or whatever I have living trying to do this insurmountable task on my own it is time for me to start showing you and sharing with you how you, if you choose, can help participate and make this a reality. So again, there is a lot of confusion, there is a lot of concern, and it is easy with something this size to simply point the finger and say, look, 
Frank talks about, okay, the Treaty of Lucifer. Frank's talking about these ideas that clearly, clearly seem at odds with what we're taught. And it's easy to erupt fear. And I'm, I'm sorry that I, I seem to leave these, uh, some ideas that people think are great, but leave it open for others to come along and, and point fingers. But there is a strategy in all of this. You know, if, if, if there is war in heaven, then there can never be peace on earth. But if there's peace in heaven, then clearly peace on earth is not just possible, but inevitable. So if there is a treaty with those entities that we are brought up to believe are the epitome of evil, that there is an end to war in heaven, then this heralds a historic moment. It, it heralds the end of war in heaven. It heralds a unity of heaven, a unity of purpose. And no longer are we dealing with the concepts of good and evil and absolutes and uh, unco unconquerable enemies, but we are merely dealing with the laggards, the incompetence and the mentally ill that refuse to accept that balance must come. So there is a purpose to these things. There is a deeper meaning to the things that I present to you. But again, if we allow ourselves, if we allow our friends to simply point the finger and we don't look deeper at what is being presented, then yes, you are going to face doubt in the constant and continual learning and lessons of UKDA. And it's going to be easy for people to, to distract you. I hope you aren't distracted because what we're going to share tonight is exciting. It's back to those dreams as a child where one day, one day, the evil, the imbalance, the illness that we are surrounded by will, will and can come to an end. I'll give you an example, classic example. You know, the mark of the beast is the number 666. I mean, it's ingrained in our psyche from a very early age, and Hollywood certainly helps us promote that in raising that symbolism in front of us. Now, this is a point of, of, of apocalyptic writing from John of Patmos, a Nazarene. And the symbolism of that, uh, when we think of it, we, we automatically assume that the mark of the beast 666 has a direct relationship to Satan, Lucifer. Well, by the way the world is operating at the moment, they absolutely place an association with Lucifer because they have already marked us with the mark of the beast. Now, just as I said, the New World Order has gone through at least three versions that I know of in the last few hundred years. The mark of the beast has been there for a long time, much longer than, than I believed it had been there. They branded us with the mark of the beast hundreds of years ago. And we have been living under that mark ever since. And what do we mean by that? Well, let's look beyond the superficially, superficiality of, of the word beast. The word beast, yes, has a meaning in the meaning of animal, but it also has the meaning to other meanings that we may not originally see, which is fool and idiot. So the mark of the beast isn't simply the mark of the animal, it's the mark of the fool, the mark of the idiot. Well, that's a little bit different. Well, where is something that we see that we are marked three times as a fool and incompetent? Well, if you've listened to the previous talk shoes and you've looked at some of the work we've been doing, we have been honing in on a fundamental element of the system, which are these Sesta KV trusts, which judges and magistrates, which lawyers and, uh, and prosecutors have been denying that they exist. Well, when we look at those, we find under the definition of Sesta KV that the word Sestri C-E-S-T-U-I, is six. We have three of them. Sestri, Sestri, Sestri. Six, six, six. Mark of the fool. A fool, one who's dead, one who's incompetent, is one of the key presumptions of the Sesta KVs. That is what they use to keep them in place, that we are fools. So they publish in front of us what they're doing. They tell us what they're doing. 
they highlight it so that 